So in this video we're going to be looking at some off-road and touring modifications for a Suzuki JB74 Jimny. Now the first thing to remember about modifying any vehicle is that there's been a bit of a trend the last few years, I think maybe even more, that you need to spend $30,000, $50,000 modifying a vehicle before you can go off-road. And that is simply absolutely not true. As a journalist, I spend a lot of time driving stock four-wheel drives off-road and they are capable. Yes, absolutely, you can and should modify them a bit, but you don't need to spend tens and tens of thousands of dollars. And this Jimny has been um, fairly well modified with sort of, I guess, a budget in mind, but also not going overboard. The other thing to remember about Jimneys is that they are a small, light vehicle. That's what makes them fun, that, that's what makes them great. But what that also means is that you don't have the space or the payload to take everything that opens that and shuts and throw it at a Jimny. You cannot modify these things in the same way you'd modify a Ford Ranger or vice versa or a light truck like an Isuzu. So let's take a look and see what this owner has done to this Jimny to improve it for her purposes. So the first thing you want to do with any four-wheel drive which you're going to be touring off-road with is change the tyres. And there's a couple of things you want to do. First thing is make sure that they're off-road tyres. Now these are BFG KM3 mud terrain, so they've got quite an extreme open pattern. You don't necessarily need to go to that level of extreme tyre, but what you should be doing is going to an LT or light truck construction tyre because that's significantly tougher and more um, puncture resistant. The other thing that owner's done has increased the diameter a little bit. So these tyres are 215 75 15. Um, I've got another video where I explain what those tyre markings mean and they are a little bit taller diameter and slightly wider and it's really the height which makes the difference off-road and then that means the vehicle is better able to climb over obstacles and it gives a tiny little bit more ground clearance but the disadvantage of taller tyres is obviously greater fuel consumption and there's something called unsprung mass as well but overall a little bit of a height increase like this is fine and uh, that will actually also be within the vehicle modification laws as well. Once you get into significantly taller diameter tyres that's the point where you've got to start to do a lot of modifications to gearing of the vehicle changes etc and um, the, the car's more capable but then there's a lot of trade-offs and a lot more money to be spent two other important points and um, one particularly important for four-wheel drives is the load and the speed rating now every tire has a minimum uh, or as a load rating which is how much load it can take and a speed rating which is how fast it can be driven now the load rating is a number in this case um, Suzuki have mandated here it's got to be no less than 90 which is equivalent than 600 kilograms so tires fitted to this vehicle must have a load rating of 90, 91, 90, whatever the case may be, beyond 90. And a speed rating symbol of not less than S, which is a letter. So that means it's got to be um, STUV, etc., something beyond that. So let's take a look at those two, the load index um, rating, the load rating and the speed rating, how that looks on this particular vehicle. So if we go around to the front here, this is where we find the vehicle's um, load and speed rating. So you can see it's 100 slash 97 there. Now there's actually two ratings and the reason there's two ratings is that if you have these two tyres running on a dual axle vehicle like a light truck then you use the lower of the two ratings which in this case would be 97. Now this is single axle so we take the higher of the two ratings which is 100. So these tyres are way more strong way more strong enough to take the load because it's a minimum of 90 there are 100 so we are absolutely ticked there with no problem at all that's typically the way with four-wheel drive tires then we come to the speed rating here which is q now the placard said i oh, must have a load rating of at least s so q comes before s in the alphabet therefore you would think that this tire is illegal well it's not because there's actually an exemption in all australian states for four-wheel drive vehicles to have tires which are n rated or um, better regardless of what the manufacturer placard says so with that exemption in mind um, a q rated tire is okay on this vehicle despite the fact the placard says s now the other thing i want to talk about is tire pressures and this is a particular problem for jimneys because some tire shops don't actually seem to understand tires 
in any way shape or form let alone tyre pressures and this particular vehicle was put up to 38 psi on I think the weird rationale that it had mud tyres therefore it must run uh, 38 psi under tyres and that's got just no basis in any form of reality anywhere in the universe. So let's look at what we actually should be doing. Now for all vehicles you start with the placard pressures here and it says clearly um, for a normal load 26 psi in the front and uh, 26 in the rear for the maximum load then 26 in the front and 29 in the rear. So that gives us a baseline. Now what we have to do on top of that is go okay what, where are we loaded? Are we going to be running around at minimum weight or maximum weight, whatever else? Now this vehicle, because it's modified, it's got the snorkel, it's got um, recovery gear in it, it's got the heavier tyres, the rock sliders, all the rest, all of that adds weight. Even changing the suspension adds weight, changing the tyres adds weight. So we're not going to run around at 26 psi, we're going to go maybe a little bit beyond that, but maybe not to, to max load. Now the tyres themselves are also different, so they're taller diameter um, and a little bit wider so they can carry uh, more air and also they're a light truck construction so that means that they've got thicker sidewalls and that means um, that they won't dissipate heat quite as easily so for all of those reasons we'd want to go up a little we certainly wouldn't want to run around at 26 26 because the more weight on a, a vehicle a vehicles tires the more pressure you've got to have so we might want to go up to maybe 28 29 something like that and that would probably be completely adequate now you can tell whether you've got the right tire Tire pressure because if you start off cold it should increase um, by maybe 2-3 psi once um, the vehicle's been running for 15-20 minutes and also then you can look at the tire itself after a period of time and just check that the wear is even. Um, if a tire is over inflated then what will happen is you'll get wear in the center of the tire, if it's under inflated you'll get wear on the outside of the tire. Now the wheels on this Jimny are standard as from the factory. Now if you want to go and buy a new set of wheels for your four-wheel drive you absolutely can and it's a really good way to improve the look of the vehicle to your tastes but you don't need to functionally the standard wheels on every four-wheel drive I've ever tested are up to the job in terms of strength and you know if you want it to look different then you can do these are also fairly high profile and by high profile what I mean is there's a long distance between the edge of the wheel and the ground so we've got a nice thick tire sidewall there one reason why you might want to change out the wheels on a four-wheel drive is when we've got something called a low profile tyre which is when you've got the wheel instead of being here it's about there and then there's not much distance between the tyre and the ground and again I've got another video where I explain why low profile tyres are evil off-road. Alright so this is a snorkel and I would suggest it is a must-have piece of insurance for any four-wheel driver. Now the purpose of the snorkel is to raise the engine's air intake the Jiminy is about here-ish all the way up to there and and what that means is that when the vehicle goes through deep water which could be potentially overlapping the windscreen um, then the engine will only ingest air as opposed to water. Now you don't want an engine to ingest water. The reason is engines are designed to run on a mixture of petrol or diesel, petrol in this case, plus air and it will actually compress that mixture, create a spark and then that's how you produce power. Water doesn't go so well with any form of, of spark in it and also it's incompressible so then the pistons will well basically the engine go goes bang so a snorkel is really cheap insurance now I like these types because I won't do it completely but you can spin the head round it you can put a pre-cleaner on it etc and for the few hundred dollars they cost it just gives you that peace of mind when you're going through deep water and particularly in the case of the Jimny which is a relatively low vehicle um, so the air intake is naturally lower because it's a smaller vehicle so having insurance uh, so having a snorkel is um, even more insurance so you've just got to look at the potential cost of an engine rebuild um, to go yeah I think it's worth worth taking that money. Now a lot of people will say oh look I'll, I'll never go through deep water that will never be a problem therefore I don't need a snorkel and I can kind of understand that but 
there will come a point in your four-wheel driving career when you've driven down a track for three or four hours and then there's this water crossing and then the main road is a kilometre away and it's getting dark and it's getting late and you can go through it or not. That is the point where you wish you had a snorkel. And the other point about snorkels is that, let's say you're going through the water and then one side of the car, in this case the right-hand side of the car, just drops in like that and then you've, what was maybe water only up to here, suddenly becomes water up to there. So snorkels really are good and sure and I do recommend that you buy one. So this is a rock slider. Now it's not a sidestep where you'd get up into the vehicle like that because it's designed to protect the sill of the vehicle which is this area here. And it's designed to protect it as you go over rocks, um, ruts, logs, whatever the case, it will just hit this very strong flat underside of the vehicle and you can actually slide the vehicle over rocks. So it gives you great protection from that perspective. You can also put a jack underneath it and jack the vehicle up although you've got to be careful then that you're not going to destabilize the vehicle so you really want to make sure that the vehicle is secured before you do any jacking off a rock slider like this. The other thing to think about with rock sliders is that um, it will change the Def deformation characteristic of the vehicle in a crash and if you've got side airbags then you need to ensure that the engineering and testing has been done to make sure that your rock sliders still work with your side airbags or at least go into that decision knowing the compromises and trade-offs that you're making. Now there's seat covers on the Jimny to protect the seats from R.M. Williams. Uh, if you're going to buy seat covers it's very important that they are airbag compatible as you can see here because there are airbags inside the seat here and you do not want the integrity of the airbags and therefore your safety compromised by the fact that you are running lovely seat covers like those. So here we've got a long range fuel tank. Now the standard tank on a Jimny is only 40 litres and it's a fairly thirsty engine with only a 4 speed automatic or a 5 speed manual so it gets through those 40 litres pretty quickly and that's why um, we've got this 80 litre long range tank in there just to give the vehicle a lot more range. The other thing you want to think about and it, um, this isn't just for Jimnys it's generally is that as soon as you modify a vehicle everything you do increases the fuel consumption. These tyres are heavier and they are are less aerodynamically efficient and they're taller. All of that will increase fuel consumption. The roof um, bars up at the top increase fuel consumption. The extra weight added, the snorkel added, everything increases fuel consumption. So instead of maybe getting whatever it is, 500 kilometers to a tank, not that I think you would on a Jimny standard, you're gonna get a lot less. And therefore, your long range fuel tank should give you back the original range and then some. And that's really important when you're doing off-road touring. Even if you're not crossing to something like the Simpson or the Canning, it's nice to be able to go away for a weekend in somewhere like the Victorian high country and not worry about fuel too much because you've just got a lot on board and it's obviously safer to carry fuel extra fuel in here tucked away great position from a center of gravity and dynamics point of view than it is to try and put jerry cans in the back or on the um, roof of the vehicle or whatever so long range tanks highly recommended now the long range tank has an effect on range and essentially it doesn't read correctly so it's reading 44 kilometers of range at the moment it's probably more like about 84 because the tank size is double but it doesn't show up in the range indicator now you're also thinking hang on that's about a third of a tank and it's only got a 44 kilometer range why is that i mean surely the vehicle's got a range for more than about 120 150 kilometers off a full tank well the reason is that we've been doing a lot of low range work and because of that we're not going to get that far high fuel consumption for not very much distance traveled so as we drive and you can see it's just gone up to 45 kilometers of range there despite the fact we're actually just um, sitting here idling at the side of the road so as we drive on and our fuel consumption drops our range will actually increase and then after a while of course it will start to decrease Right, so we've used a little bit of fuel, but not much, because we've still got three bars there, and the range has actually gone up to 78 kilometres, and that's because we've been driving on rural roads, and therefore using a lot less fuel per kilometre than what we were when we were going around in low range. And it actually did get to a high of 18, it's starting to drop again now, so this is now a realistic range, should we have the 40 litre tank, but as we've got an 80 litre tank, we can double that, so from 80, it's probably closer to 160 real world range. With right, so with any vehicle, 
where you get, one of the first things you want to do is seek out all of the little nooks and crannies and storage areas and figure out what you're going to store where. So generally you want, and there's several different conflicting rules, you want to keep the heavy bulky stuff towards the centre of the vehicle and low if you possibly can and there's a lot of stuff which you need to get to frequently or potentially when you can't open all the doors in the vehicle such as your recovery gear so you want to have that in different locations and I've actually got mine in three or four different locations so if the vehicle is stuck at a weird angle I can always get to get to some of it. Now the Jimny has got this little area here and as you can see that's pretty good for um, this hitch which will go in there we'll talk about that in a second we've got some shackles gloves there's a soft shackle but I've taken it around to the front as a first aid kit so you know you, you can put um, some recovery gear in there which is nice and the owner has also got put installed these tie downs here because you do want to make sure that things aren't loose as that is at the moment and uh, they're not going to go anywhere and this bit of extra matting here just protects um, the whole vehicle and then those are the seats which you can see have been folded down at that point. Now when you stop for your morning tea or lunch, because I've heard sometimes people do actually stop for, for morning tea, weird I know, but it's a thing. Um, this is really handy for um, vehicles that have got a swing out tailgate. So you can bring that down like so, and then it, that becomes a little table. And you see them for Pajeros, um, GU patrols and like, so there's one for the Jimny, which is good. But I um, haven't seen this too often, so you can actually change the angle of it. You can move it up and down like that, and then use that. So if you add a bit of a slope, then it gets to the right angle. So I think that's kind of neat. And then um, that just um, retentions up like so, so nice little bit of equipment there. All right, now at the back of the vehicle, the most important modification is the one made for spiritual guidance and assistance here. Now, if we move on from that, let's talk about the rest of the back of the car. Now, we've got a tow bar at the back, always a good idea to fit a tow bar to a four-wheel drive, just in case um, you need to tow anything. And let's talk about towing capacities. The Jimny can tow, as it says here, 1.3 tons, 1,300 kilograms. That is a braked towing capacity, i.e. the trailer's got braked. What's the unbraked towing capacity? Maximum you might be thinking, oh, well, that's 750, that's the standard. Well, no, it's not because with a lot of lighter vehicles like Jimneys or Foresters or something like that, the maximum unbraked towing capacity is a lot less than 750 kilograms and in the case of the Jimny it's 350 kilograms beyond that you need a trailer for legality and also I'd argue for sensibility reasons as well. So we've got our tow hitch receiver here and in that um, look you could um, put a strap through a pin and pop that through but it's actually much better to use a hitch receiver like this which is one from Factor 55 designed for soft shackles. Now you notice this is somewhat scratched and the reason is it doesn't accurately, does, that should just slide in really easily and it doesn't. Now I don't know why, maybe this is just a fraction narrow, this is a fraction wide. This is the sort of thing you've got to sort out at home before you go forward driving. You don't want to be stuffing around trying to get this into a hole and trying to pull it back, back out um, when it's wet, raining and your car's sinking slowly into the mud. So always check out your recovery gear before you come out into the bush. All right, so apart from not fitting in the receiver correctly, um, this is designed for soft shackle. Here is a soft shackle. Now this is a very heavy duty soft shackle from Sabre, 20,000 kilogram rating, um, and it doesn't really want to fit through the hole here. So we don't need a soft shackle of this capacity for a vehicle this light. And even if we had one, you know, it's, it's a real struggle to fit it through the hole there. And it, this isn't really designed for um, metal shackles either. So again, this comes back to sort of sorting out all your recovery gear before you go out into the bush. Now on either side of the tow bar we've got a recovery point here and here so we've really got three options for recovery so you could do a straight pull off that once you get um, this thing sorted out um, or you could use a bridle coming off this one and this one together I've got another video on bridles or you could just do a recovery off one of them which you might want to do if you slew the vehicle sideways obviously the strongest and easiest pull would be to use either a bridle or, or, the, um, or the tow hitch recovery point there it's good to see good to see you've got options. Now this vehicle also has cross axle front and rear differential locks. I'm going to explain what they are and demonstrate them in a separate video featuring this vehicle. That's the rear, that's the front and the switches go in and out like that. They are air operated and that means we need an air compressor that's underneath the bonnet and the switch for the air compressor is here. 
Now the air compressor can also be used to increase the air pressure of your tyres because when you're off-road typically you'd want to reduce your air pressure a bit and then you want to increase it for the drive home at highway speeds on bitumen. Now another modification you typically want to make to your vehicle is to replace the suspension if you're going to go full wheel driving and touring. And the reason is, when a new vehicle is made, the suspension's got to be a compromise between it riding around town with absolutely no load and it um, just driving in the suburbs and fully loaded, towing to the max, whatever the case may be. So that suspension is a compromise between those two extremes. Now if your use case is more specific than that and you know that you'd rather, um, I don't know, spend all your time driving fairly heavily loaded etc then it makes sense to optimize the suspension for what you're going to do so that's the reason why um, four-wheel drives typically have aftermarket suspension because we carry more weight due to all those modifications and we want also a little bit more clearance we want the vehicle to sit a little bit higher and that's what's going on here so um, these orange yellowy curly things those are the springs they support the weight of the vehicle and um, absorb the bumps and then these here these are the shock absorbers or dampers and if we didn't have them basically imagine a rubber ball sort of bouncing and bouncing and bouncing well this is kind of like a coffee plunger inside of it and that just stops the bouncing movement so those are your shockers and your dampers those are your springs and they have the combined uh, well, three things they do one is they lift the vehicle slightly 40 millimeters in this case this gives it a little bit more um, clearance for going over off-road the second thing is it supports the weight better because this vehicle carries more weight than a standard because of the modifications and then th this is actually part of that GVM upgrade kit so with this kit the vehicle is legally allowed to carry a little bit more weight than standard and that's a good thing when you're touring off-road all right, so this bar is an aftermarket modification and it's dropped this um, bar down by a few millimeters. And the reason is that there's a prop shaft coming from the differential, which is inside there. And if that wasn't in, um, uh, moved, then that prop shaft, which I'm just touching here, would actually impact that bar at maximum articulation. So this is the sort of engineering companies have to think about when they start modifying suspension. How does it work at maximum deflection? What does it work on under um, different weight levels etc and get it all checked out engineered and certified so at the front we've got recovery points and the Jimny doesn't really have any as standard so it's important to get them fitted now you do need recovery points front and rear that's just and there's very few things in four-wheel driving you say you must have but this is something you must have because sooner or later you will get stuck it's not a question of skill it, it just happens to the best of us from time to time and when you get stuck you're going to be needing to recover the vehicle that might involve a winch it might involve a kinetic energy recovery or some such or even just be be um, towed out gently either which way you're going to be moving the vehicle pretty much almost against its will and you're going to put significant force and strain on the vehicle you don't anything to break that's why you have recovery points here which are designed for the purpose these are rated with a working load limit of three tons now i don't know the braking load limit beyond that but you presume they've done their testing it's okay to three tons and that's about double the maximum weight of this vehicle so we should be pretty safe now these are slightly beveled which is good to see because then that means that they're friendly on the soft shackles like that and then you can attach that and then you can be pulled out and because there's two of them there again you could potentially use a bridle watch watch my bridles video because i explode some myths about using bridles there you attach a rope to there to there and then just um uh, do a central pull from from two locations or you could just pull it off one but either which way recovery point really important. So in the front we've got perhaps the world's most stupid automatic transmission only four gears and it can't decide which of them to use it really is pathetic it should be a six-speeder um, we've got the power windows here and here we've got stability control on and off and that does require a mod for sand driving we might talk about another time hill descent control and um, if you don't know where your towel is this is what you have to press now roof racks are a really handy place to store items or recovery gear camping gear whatever else because it's easy to access there's a lot of room up there so it's tempting just to chuck a lot of stuff on the roof now every vehicle however has a roof load limit and i have explained the different roof load limits in another video in great detail so i'm going to go over that again here one thing i will say to gym owners though your roof load limit is only 30 kilograms which is hardly anything 
And remember, that 30 kilograms needs to account for the weight of the rack as well as whatever you put on it. You can't put the rack on and then go, okay, I'm gonna add 30 kilograms on top of that. So if you've got a 15 kilogram roof rack or 20 kilogram roof rack, you can only put 10 kilograms of stuff up there, which is really not very much. So this is why this owner has just gone for two rails here on which she can put her kayak. You could put a set of max tracks or something like that. And then this awning over here, and then that's within the 30 kilogram limit once the kayak is on board but don't be caught out by trying to put too much stuff on top of the rack also the vehicle will start to handle pretty badly you can see it doesn't take much just to put that massive amount of body roll in and I'm not exactly super heavy um, so imagine you had a lot of heavy stuff up here you're really going to get that body roll happening around the corner and that's not great for stability and you know directional stability is let's face it not a gymney strength to begin with now the Jimny has got a tear weight, that's an unladen weight, of around 1100 kilograms and its maximum weight, the GVM or gross vehicle mass, is around um, the 1560 mark. So that means it's got a payload of around 360 kilograms, which is how much it can carry. Now that's got to account for the driver, the occupants and all the modifications, even things like um, the additional weight of the aftermarket tyres, etc. Now this vehicle has what's termed a GVM upgrade, so its maximum legal weight has been increased and we've got a modification plate for that I'll show you in a second and that extended range fuel tank also requires a modification plate so it's important to get any modifications of this nature um, certified and engineered so that they are legal but not all modifications need to be certified a snorkel for example doesn't need a mod plate a uh, long range tank does and a GVM upgrade does and here are the two plates so this one over here deals with the um, increased fuel comp tank capacity, the long range tank, and this one is the GVM um, upgrade and both have been certified and signed off as you can see. Now this is the placard which has replaced the factory one. So SSM is second stage um, manufacturer. As you can see the GVM has been upgraded to 1560 kilograms, max towing mass etc unchanged, axle weights um, so that replaced the standard sticker. So your big question now is, what do all these mods and accessories actually weigh? Well, let's start off with the tyres. They are taller, wider and heavier duty, so they weigh an extra 30 kilograms. The cross axle air lockers, we'll cover them in another video. They weigh 2.2. Rock sliders, about 15 kilograms per side. All of these weights are approximate, but they all add up a couple of kilograms here, a couple of kilograms there, even the snorkel weighs a little bit. The long range tank, that's not an addition. It's a replacement of existing, but that's heavier, so we add a bit more for that and so on. And we come to a total of 159 kilograms. Now, what does that mean for our payload? Well, our stock vehicle has a GVM, the maximum it can weigh, the gross vehicle mass, 1435. The tear weight is meant to be 175 kilograms. We haven't tested that. Normally it's a bit off, but let's run with it. Giving us 360 kilograms worth of payload. Now, we've already used 159 kilograms of that payload in modifications. That leaves 201 kilograms for the driver, the passenger, and camping gear and everything else to put in the car. The GVM upgrade, upgraded vehicle has a GVM of 1560 kilograms, same tear weight, greater payload, and that means that we have 326 kilograms left for the occupants and the camping gear and everything else. So that was a quick walk around of this Jimny. Many thanks to the owner for letting me explain how those Jimny modifications work. She didn't want to appear on camera, so I've done all the talking. And I hope you found this video interesting and useful. If you've got any questions, please drop them in the comments. And thank you for watching.